Washington and for, uh, uh, I worked for the FAA for the last, God, I can't believe 30 years. But uh, uh, I've worked in avionics. I'm a licensed airframe power plant mechanic, but I've worked avionics most all of my career, which is aviation electronics. And I uh, thought there, there's a new system uh, that's actually was uh, put into place officially on January this year. And we'll talk about that. It's called ADSB. But first off, let's talk about what we've got now, and that's uh, radar and the principles of radar. So what it, everything is an acronym. So uh, radio direction and ranging. So it tells us that we've got, we can tell what direction something is, and we can, uh, ranging is like distance. So if you uh, see a radar installation, like out at uh, DIA, and if you're going to DIA and you uh, just uh, all, half a mile before the uh, where the old toll gate used to be, if you know where I mean, you look off to the left, uh, to the south, you'll, or, or north rather, the north, you'll see something similar to this. It's, it's on a, a steel structure, not a, not a building like this. But it'll have two antennas on it, real similar to this. And this is the primary radar antenna. And it's a you know, big reflector. Here's your, uh, uh, your feed, which fires into that and also receives a signal coming back to the receiver. And obviously, this thing rotates 360 degrees. And then on top here, we've got a uh, SS radar, secondary sur uh, surveillance radar. We'll talk about that here uh, in a minute. So what's primary radar? Uh, primary radar uh, is uh, conventional radar. Sensors that illuminate a large portion of, this, of space with electromagnetic waves and receives back the reflect reflected wave from targets uh, within that space. So you know, it's, it's pretty broad, and uh, it's given us back uh, uh, as the microwave pulses hit the target and bounce back uh, mathematically. Uh, you can figure how far relatively the aircraft is, and the de depicts here uh, transmits out as this rotates, hits this airplane, comes back. So you measure the microseconds it, it, it took, and, and you can tell relatively how far that aircraft is from this antenna. And you can also tell the direction it is because this rotates, and, and if it's uh, pointing 90 degrees east, and that's what you paint, you, you know that he's uh, relatively 90 degrees from the position of this antenna. So what do we know and what we don't we know with primary radar? Uh, we know the direction of the aircraft from the radar site, and we know the distance of the aircraft from the radar site. And we know the relative direction of travel from the radar site. And that would be if, if the airplane's turning or going away or coming towards you as it paints that target over and over. It'll, it'll get you know, further away or closer, go be left, be right, and, and so forth. So who is that aircraft? <clears throat> we don't know. And how high is the aircraft? We don't know that either. Well, that's a couple of pretty uh, uh, important things. If we got a couple airplanes out there, and uh, maybe they're coming towards each other, uh, we don't know if they're ones at 10,000 feet and the others at 12,000 feet, or uh, uh, we don't know that because we don't have that uh, information. So a little bit more about the two types of radars that are used and long-range surveillance radar and terminal service radar. Here's some important parts about this that will really uh, make, make sense why we go to this uh, ADSB a little later when we get more into it. So your long-range radar, uh, surveillance radar, that antenna rotates five to six revolutions a minute. Pretty slow. And just for gee whiz, if you're familiar out in uh, uh, I-225 and you're uh, in the area of uh, Smoky Hill and you look off to the east, 
you'll see a, a dome back there, a uh, yellow white dome uh, sitting on top of steel structure. And that is what this is. It's a long range surveillance radar and it's known as the Parker Long Range. So more on that, um, if this radar antenna, it's painting that target every five or six resolutions. And something that we'll know here is that the radar antenna at that rotation, uh, it's painting that signal every roughly 12 seconds. So if this, uh, if this uh, airplane is flying at uh, 500 knots, that means that uh, every time it paints this target, that airplane will travel about six tenths of a mile. So you can see that they're they're uh, they're eating up a lot of space uh, at that speed. Now, the terminal service radar. And there again, if you're you're going into uh, DIA and you look out uh, to the uh, north there, you'll see a, a tower with an antenna on it that basically looks uh, sort of like that. Got a better picture here. So, okay, what's the range of air traffic uh, control radar? And uh, it depends for the intended purpose. Uh, for the terminal access, air traffic control uses the airport surveillance radar, or ASR. That's the second one I showed you there. And it's got a range of around 60 miles. So that's what's going to be used when an aircraft is coming into Denver or uh, leaving. It'll be, they'll be looking at it on the uh, airport surveillance radar. And as you can see, uh, that antenna moves about twice as fast as this one. Uh, so it will... Uh, uh, be uh, uh, paint that target more frequently, and also uh, when an aircraft is in the uh, uh, area of the airport, they're usually uh, 250 miles uh, an hour or less. So, well, the long range surveillance radar, what we're talking about here, it's 2.4 gigahertz and it has a range of about 250 miles. And like I say, it turns uh, uh, five to six revolutions a minute. And it's L-band, it's one to two gigahertz. And uh, the, the power on these is pretty high. On the uh, terminal radar, it's like 50 kilowatts. And the uh, long range radar, it's a, it's a megawatt or more. And this is peak power. These are, uh, are um, microsecond pulses. So, another picture uh, that you would see out there by DIA. And, and there's also another station just like this, or another radar out by Platteville. Uh, it's pretty important in a, in a big airport, uh, you know, to have uh, reliability and backup. So, uh, by Park, uh, by not Parker, but uh, Platteville, there's another uh, remote site out there. And they're not manned. Uh, they, they can do a lot remotely, uh, just like a lot of other things. You, you can do a lot of remote control and see what's uh, failed and so forth uh, remotely. So this antenna up here, it's on this structure. It rotates just like uh, the primary radar antenna, but it's uh, called secondary surveillance radar. And, and secondary surveillance radar is a radar system used air traffic control that not only detects and measures the position of the aircraft, which you're bearing in distance, just like your uh, primary does, but it also requests inf uh, additional information. So how does it uh, uh, how does it do that? So what information does the uh, secondary surveillance radar send? It's, it sends bearing, just like uh, the primary. And it, it will give you distance, just like the primary. But it also gives you pressure altitude. So with pressure altitude, you, you can tell how high that aircraft is, what its altitude is. And it also sends back a code that's assigned by air traffic uh, when that airplane leaves uh, wherever it's leaving from. Uh, air traffic will give them a, a specific 
specific code. It's a four letter, uh, four letter code. And here's our secondary radar. You'll notice in this depiction, there's just the one antenna. So it's sending out pulses and it's getting replies, but it's not getting it directly off the aircraft. It doesn't bounce off the aircraft. There's a, another piece of equipment on there called a transponder. And uh, this interrogates the transponder and gets uh, additional information. So is secondary surveillance radar really radar? Like I said, it doesn't bounce a signal off the, off the uh, aircraft like primary radar does. So not by the true definition of radar, it's not really radar because no signal bounces back from the aircraft. Secondary surveillance uh, requires a transponder on the aircraft to operate. And uh, without an operational transponder, the system's non-functional. And so all large air transport aircraft have two transponders for there again for backup. Now, if we get in the cockpit of uh, this aircraft, we're going to see something like this. Transponder control head. It's got your test standby, uh, your different settings. And these two knobs here, inner and outer knob, is where you'll set the, uh, the code that's given by uh, air traffic control. So, like if they give 5655, that's what they'll put in here. And you'll notice, all, so another couple switches, you got an alternate source, and you got transponder one, transponder two. Like I said, uh, all large aircraft have two transponders, and they have uh, a couple sources of. Uh, altitude data. So uh, uh, if one's on the fritz and they have a call it air data computer uh, that, that gives that, uh, that code to the transponder. So if that if two is bad, they can switch to one and same with the transponder. And normally in their uh, procedures, uh, either daily or each leg or whatever their air, airline's procedure is, they'll, they'll switch from one to two because you don't want to fly on number two here for a week and then uh, find out it fails and switch to one and it's already failed. So, And there's, there's a button on here I want you to look at called IDENT and we'll talk about that uh, in a minute here. So secondary radar operates on uh, the ground operates at 1030 megahertz and the aircraft operates at 1090. So uh, uh, similar to a, a repeater system. you got two different frequencies. The aircraft transponder transmits on 1090 and uh, receives on uh, 1030. So you got a split frequency there of uh, 60 megahertz. Here's some of the codes. These are fixed codes. Uh, if you're flying around in your little, uh, get a drink here, excuse me. You're flying around here in your little Cessna 172 or a light twin or something, and you're just flying visual from airport to airport or airport to somewhere, uh, you're going to squawk 1,200 on your transponder, this little window here. You'll have something similar on a uh, light aircraft, and you'll it's usually right on the unit, and you'll, you'll select the uh, 1,200 code. Gliders have a, a sign code of 1202. There's a hijack code. There's a communication failure code, emergency code, and then a military intercept uh, code. And then we have that ident button on the control head. So this is a typical display, the best one I could find, uh, of a what air traffic controller, he's looking at something real similar to this uh, at uh, either out of DIA or up at Denver Center, depending on, uh, on where... Uh, you know, that's another thing I mentioned. The, you know, the local control, like for DIA, it's at DIA, and your in route stuff is up at Longmont, and uh, it's called uh, uh, that's your uh, Denver Center up there for your aircraft going over and uh, transitioning and so forth. But anyway, uh, you'll see these different codes here, and I'll pick one I can kind of read, and that's, that's Continental uh, 186. 
And so it's given the flight number because uh, they put that the code in. And when, when that's initialized, they uh, sync that code with uh, the aircraft flight number. So instead of showing a transponder code of, like I said, 5565 or something, it will show the flight number. And it'll, it'll show the altitude. And it'll show the type of airplane. In this case, this is a, a Boeing uh, 757-200. Uh, this one here, BTA, I'm not sure, sure who they are. They're 3,800 feet. It's an ATR, which is a twin-engine commuter. And here you got LOF. I'm not sure who they are. Uh, it's an EMB-145. And so uh, this is kind of what the uh, controller's looking at. Now, uh, talk about that idea in a second. <clears throat> uh Let's say you, you've got a, a and it, it's not more than likely used with general aviation, more so than these guys. But you got an airplane going into maybe like what I still call Jeffco, but Rocky Mountain Metropolitan. And uh, the controllers in the uh, towers, like in the GA airports, they don't control with, with this. They use it as a reference. So you guy's flying in there and he says, hey, this is, uh, Piper or so-and-so, and I'm five miles uh, uh, north of the airport. And, uh, you know, he's requesting to land. Well, the controller looks out the window, and maybe with his binoculars, and he looks at the radar display. He don't see anybody out here five miles. So he'll say, uh, Piper, so-and-so, I dent. Well, when, when he pushes the I dent button, if this was him, this would get brighter, and then it would flash for a few seconds. But let's just say this is down here, so the controller is going to say, uh, "Are you sure you're not uh, uh, south of the airport?" Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. So that's kind of how the ident function is used uh, with a radar. All radar sites are not both primary and secondary. And a real good example of that is Aspen. Um, Aspen Airport is only secondary service radar. And so why? And the reason there's so many mountains and so much rock and so much uh, stuff up there, you get what you call ground clutter. It's just the uh, signal coming off the primary radar just bounces all over the place. And it just... Uh, it makes the screen unusable. So, in a in a in a, if you were to see the uh, radar up at Aspen, it would basically look like this. There'd be no primary on it. It would be just secondary uh, radar. So, um, and the question is going to be, well, uh, it has to have a transponder to operate. That's true. So, if there's no transponder. Uh, the secondary won't see it. You know, I guess nothing's perfect, but uh, if they're flying VFR, it's uh, seeing a void. And it, any larger aircraft going in there, they're going to already been on uh, uh, positive radar control, so they're going to know where they are. But you know, that is a that is a hole. Uh, Okay, I'm going to hold questions here. If you got questions on this, please kind of hold on to them, and we'll kind of do that at the end. I think it'd be a little easier. <clears throat> so now we're going to talk about next gen, and uh, which is next generation. And uh, the FAA has been under this modernization for a number of years, and and uh, so here's the school. The school description, next gen's the FAA-led modernization of our uh, national air transport system, known as the NAS. Its goal is to increase the safety, efficiency, and capacity, predictability, and resilience of American aviation. <clears throat> this overhaul brings together innovative technologies, capabilities, and procedures that improve how we fly from departure to arrival. Like I say, that's the FAA school uh, school description of next gen. 
<clears throat> and next gen is more than just ADSB. There's other parts of it that, uh, you know, kind of for another time, I guess, uh, it goes a lot, uh, a lot deeper. So we'll just be covering uh, ADSB on this presentation. So what is ADSB? What is it? Automatic dependent surveillance broadcast. And I need another drink of water. So automatic, it's always on and requires no operator intervention. It's dependent. It depends on the accurate uh, GNSS signal for position data. This is uh, the global satellites, GPS. Surveillance, it provides radar-like surveillance services, much like radar. But it's, there again, not radar. And broadcast, it continuously broadca broadcasts aircraft position and other data to any aircraft uh, and other data, well, to any aircraft or ground station equipped to receive it. So we'll get a little bit more into that. How's it work? Far different from radar. There again, this is the school uh, answer, uh, which works by bouncing radio waves from fixed terrestrial antennas off a ground tar gr airborne target and then interprets the reflected signal. ADSB uses conventional global navigation satellites, the GNSS technology, and a relatively simple broadcast communication link as it uh, as a fundamental component. Also, unlike radar, <clears throat> ADSB accuracy does not seriously degrade with range, atmospheric conditions, or target uh, altitude, and update intervals. Important there, we'll get into that. The update intervals do not depend on a rotating, uh, rotational speed or a reliability of mechanical antennas. And of course, those mechanical antennas, there's a lot of moving parts and motors and, and uh, uh, couplings and a lot of stuff that can go wrong and sometimes does. In a typical application, ADSB <clears throat> capable aircraft uses an ordinary uh, GPS receiver to derive its uh, precise position. Now, you know, before we were talking with radar, we are talking relative positions, meaning, uh, you know, that's about where it is. This is a much more pre precise position from the uh, global uh, constellation. And then uh, you combine that position with any number of uh, aircraft discrete, such as speed, heading, and altitude, and flight number. And this information is simultaneously broadcast to uh, ADSB capable aircraft and the ground stations. So um, where we're working into here, a little bit more on how it works. So here's our satellite up here. And it's the, these two aircraft are receiving that GPS satellite. So this airplane, he knows exactly where he is. This guy knows exactly where he is. And depicting by these arrows, they're sending this information back and forth, forth to each other. So this guy knows where he is, and he knows where he is. Also, <coughs> excuse me, this information is sent to a ground station, and that is sent to air traffic. Here's your air traffic controller. Um, so there, in a nutshell, that's, that's how it works. Uh, we'll get into a little more of the technical stuff. Uh, solution for ADSB equipage, equipage being what's on the aircraft. There's two types, and uh, first off, we'll talk about the Universal Access Transceiver, UAT. And this operates on 978 megahertz, transmit and receive. And this is for aircraft that operate below 18,000 feet, uh, MSL, mean sea level. And this would be your, uh, like I say, your Cessna, your Piper, your light twin, uh, aircraft that, uh, uh, helicopters, uh, stuff that doesn't go 
uh, above 18,000. It transmits to other UAT equipped aircraft. So they're, they're transmitting to each other and it's transmitting to the ground station. Here's a big important thing. Uh, it transmits this data every second. Remember back up when we're talking uh, with the primary radar, uh, it was every uh, five or six uh, revolutions. So like 10 or 12 seconds, we're talking one second here. And even with the uh, secondary radar or the uh, uh, airport radar, surveillance radar, uh, it's still about uh, a half, uh, you know, half again the speed. So you can see this is every, every second. And there's over 800 ground stations in the CONUS. The CONUS is the continental United States. So why is this important? Remember earlier we said long range uh, antenna rotates five to six revolutions a minute. The aircraft position is reported every six seconds. In that six seconds, the aircraft flies, uh, flying 500 knots travels over half a mile, six tenths of a mile. ADS-B reports every one second. In one second, the same aircraft travels about a tenth of a mile. So uh, as the NAS grows, more aircraft can safely opera, occupy the space. And, you know, air, aircraft, uh, air travels expanded exponentially until COVID-19. And uh, uh, with conventional radar, for a safety factor, you have to uh, keep aircraft in trail further for safety because, you, you know, you, you're not getting that update of information uh, every second. So you have to give a lot more space uh, either en route, going like from here to Chicago or L.A., or uh, as aircraft are taking off for landing uh, under the... Uh, the radar control here. This is a just a, a I said there's 800 uh, stations about or more in the United States. Each one of these little what looks like dots is actually a triangle kind of depicts where the stations are. This is Puerto Rico. This is uh, Guam. This is uh, Hawaii, and this is Alaska. And this uh, this uh, key here. Gives a little more detail to it. <clears throat> this brown is kind of interesting. It says uh, you got coverage at of, uh, at uh, 1,500 feet, and this is in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. So why is that important in the Gulf of Mexico? There's a tremendous amount of uh, air uh, helicopter traffic out in the Gulf of Mexico for all the oil rigs, and these uh, ADSB stations are. I believe mostly on oil rigs positioned on there. So uh, uh, that gives coverage out there. Uh, the rest of it here, uh, this blue is at uh, 1,800 feet. Uh, this is at, what, 5,100 feet and, uh, and uh, 18,000 feet depicted by the different, uh, different colors. So uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of stations out there. <clears throat> and we're just talking here UATs the UAT coverage for your your uh, uh, lower flying aircraft. So what does an ADSB site look like? Pretty much like this. Uh, actually, the only one I've ever seen fairly close is up at the Broomfield. And as you go into the airport on the uh, west there, if you look, you can see a tower similar to this. The antennas are kind of interesting, and I'm only guessing on a couple things here. I would have guessed their diversity receive these two. These two look alike, and then this—I uh, don't know. Then maybe this is a transmit antenna. But anyway, station looks something like that. I don't know any of the real uh, details of it. I'd like to find out. I will one of these days. Okay, <clears throat> we covered the uh, UATs for the uh, lighter aircraft, lower flying aircraft. Now the second solution for ADB, ADSB equipage is a 1090 uh, ES transponder. ES 
is extended squitter. And we'll have a, a little bit here in a second on what squitter is. They operate on 1090 megahertz, transmit and receive with a newer or a modified tr uh, transponder. So they're not only uh, uh, talking to the ground station, uh, they're sending out their data on 1090 uh, to the other stations. And this is used above or below 18,000 feet. And it transmits and receives from other aircraft and ground stations. And another, this is important, it transmits again every second uh, with a high data rate. So both of these systems put this data out every second. So squitter, and here's the school answer again. If you ever flown with a MODES transponder, you've already done your fair amount of squittering. By definition, the word squitter refers to a periodic burst or broadcast of aircraft tracking data that's transmitted periodically by a MODES transponder without interrogation from controller's radar. So it's just putting this out, this, this data. And uh, MODES, and, which stands for uh, mode select, and that's, like I say, a subject for no, no whole other uh, discussion. Uh, the MODES technology was uh, developed in the mid-'70s, and uh, it's a way of uh, uh, cutting down on uh, uh, the traffic. They use existing ground-based surveillance, secondary surveillance radar, SR, that we talked about, to track onboard transponders more precisely and more efficiently while reducing the number of interrogations required uh, and follow uh, aircraft on uh, controller's radar scope. So the long, well, let's talk about this first. The, the greatly oversimplified, the, the, the terminology of squawk is a response an air, a transponder makes to an ATC interrogation, while a squit is a transmission format that routinely sends aircraft ID and position information without being interrogated. So it, it just sends it on its own at, at, a, at a fixed time rate. And this reduces the need for back and forth interrogation response uh, over the air and uh, it minimizes the chatter in the system, increases the target handling capacity. And this is all technical stuff, you know, that makes it uh, tick, but uh, interesting nevertheless. Uh, let's see, what else we... So, uh, the maintaining radar sites, uh, beside not being as efficient as AEDSB, are expensive, and so the long-term thing here is to uh, probably do away with uh, most of the uh, uh, long-range radar. I understand that uh, for military reasons, uh, radar that... Uh, is around our borders will probably continue to operate for uh, security uh, reasons, but uh, that's just what I what I hear. Um, anyway, let's see. From there, what do we need to talk? Okay, um, what we've been what we've been talking about is ADSB out, and this is what was required in January that most all aircraft. Uh, it was mandatory. January 1st, 2nd actually, of this year that they have ADSB out. And that means, you know, like we're talking to your Cessnas, your Pipers, your Light Twins, your helicopters, especially stuff that flies in, in, the, in your uh, class of airspace around here required to have ADSB uh, out. So it can put out its position altitude and all that to other aircraft and to the ground station. But ADSB in is not required, but it gives the pilot a, a mirror of information. And it requires additional equipment, including a cockpit display unit. And uh, <clears throat> if you've got ADSB b in, uh, and a lot of light aircraft do, uh, there's advisory ser services. Uh, this one's called FISB, 
which is uh, traffic information uh, service broadcast. Everything has to have an acronym. Uh, if you don't have an acronym, uh, you can't talk about it. These are free services transmitted automatically to aircraft equipped to receive ADSB in. And then you got FISB provides a broad range of uh, text and graphical weather products and other information to the general aviation community. So AD, uh, FISB is only available on your 978 universal transceivers and uh, equipped uh, primarily uh, uh, due to bandwidth. It takes more bandwidth to do that. And uh, here's some of the stuff that it includes if you're equipped, and that's all these uh, acronyms, but uh, they're weather reports, uh, terminal forecasts, uh, uh, NEXRAD precipitation, that NEXRAD is your weather radar, uh, NOTABS, uh, all this different stuff, uh, status of special use aircraft, aerospace, <coughs> TFRs, now that's a real important one. Anybody that's flown, uh, you, you got to be particular attention to TFRs. For instance, if the president is uh, at Colorado Springs, well, there's going to be a TFR, temporary flight restriction, within a certain area. And also, uh, and I don't know if, if this would be used for MOAs. An MOA is a military operating uh, 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 area, MOA. And uh, so you don't want to be out there in your Cessna 172 if the F-16s are out there uh, flying around at, uh, at uh, you know, Mach, whatever. So it would be a, a real good feature to be able to get the TFRs. And winds and temperatures aloft, pilot reports, which would be like if uh, maybe there's a fire going on and an uh, aircraft reporting uh, you know, a lot of smoke on the west side of the airport that could be put out in a PIREP. And uh, this is all free, and there's more uh, more coming. Uh, don't want to miss anything here, but you're probably getting tired of listening to me drone on. Anyway, uh, are, are the 1090 uh, ES and the UAT systems connected? Yes. So... Whether you're uh, in a big airplane with the uh, the 1090 extended squitter or you're in your Cessna, uh, that data is uh, sent to uh, FA facility and combined. So uh, the big guys can see the little guys and vice versa. Uh, and I was going to say, uh, with this information here, uh, other than other than the bandwidth and all. Uh, the reason a lot of this is not available to your your airline type aircraft is they've got their own systems of doing this. They've got dispatchers that provide uh, weather and notams and, and all kind of stuff to them. But you know, by regulation, that's the way. If you're a, an airline that uh, uh, by regulation that you have to uh, operate, they they can't just go out there. Uh, like you can your light aircraft and, and do basically what they want. It's much, much more uh, structured, and that's that's typically what I deal with is that kind of stuff. Not so much general aviation. I, I've done that, but I, I don't much anymore. Um, you can monitor ADSB at home, and unlike radar data, uh, you can monitor air traffic at home. And here's just, uh, if you're interested at all, Here's there's a Stratus ADSB by Dynon, and Dynon is a, uh, a company that makes a lot of uh, uh, avionics equipment uh, for uh, general aviation and experimental aircraft and like that. Uh, and Sentry by Forflight, uh, there's an outfit called PC Part Source, and they've got some stuff for about eighty five dollars, and you can get a free version of Flight Plan, and you know. Like anything works with a computer, you got to have software. Here's another one that's uh, Raspberry Pi in the Sky, around $115. Uh, you can build your own antennas, or Amazon has them for like 13 bucks a piece. And there's a Google ADSB home receiver. I haven't really looked into that. Uh, but uh, uh, 
this is kind of a poor picture of kind of what a, a home system would look like. I don't know what happened to my picture. It got cut off here, but here you've got two antennas, and one of these would be for 1090, one would be for uh, 978, so uh, your coax. Here's a couple of dongle-type uh, receivers in your cabling, and a Raspberry Pi. Not sure what these two wires coming out of here, flying leads on them really are, but uh, and then you've got uh, your display screen here, which somehow got cut off. So uh, if you you can watch aircraft uh, going over and and uh, in the area, if you're so interested, my neighbor over here has uh, he's got a, a home unit, and I need to go over and see it when the uh, uh, pandemic is. Uh, uh, over, but you can uh, uh, fairly reasonably you can do that. Uh, watch air traffic at home, uh, right on your iPad or your uh, or your tablet or whatever, with not too much expense. There's also uh, a couple systems. Uh, I think Stratus ADSB. This one, as I recall, it's several hundred dollars, but it's a really it's a real nice unit, and I believe this one is also. You get into this stuff, that's where you're getting into your, uh, kind of put it together yourself. So, um, anyway, that's kind of the end. Uh hope it was informative. Uh, I'll try to answer questions, Jeff. I don't know how you, if you want to let them open a mic, or if you want to type it, or I haven't, I've been yakking, so I haven't, uh, uh, looked at the, uh, I'm trying to look here for the, uh, I don't see anything that's, uh, APR. Yeah, I'm not seeing much in yeah. chat. There's a couple. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Well, if, uh, if somebody has a question, I'll, I'll try to answer it. Like I say, I'm no, uh, no expert, uh, but it's just kind of an overview to show you what, uh, you know, what's coming down the road and kind of why. And you can, you know, hopefully the, the explanations show you that, uh, you know, radar, which I, I think has been in in service since, uh, what, mid-40s probably in, uh, in, in, in the United States. And uh, it, it's, it's developed a lot. Um, the, you know, the, the, the theory is the same since the beginning, but... Uh, the computer software for the FA radars uh, is amazing, uh, and even today, there's uh, groups that that's all they do is uh, do updates to the to the software and and, and make it uh, make it better. But you can see with the speed that uh, data can be uh, uh, delivered, uh, how it uh, will, will be much more. Uh, help, uh, enhance safety, and that's what we're all about. You know, with the FAA, my my title is aviation safety inspector, and you know, my whole life's about safety, and and uh, and that's what the whole FAA is about. So, uh, uh, anyway, I hope that makes sense. Hey, so, Jerry, Daryl Daryl Connolly made a comment in the chat. ADSB. How it is not required if you do not fly into mode C areas around Class B airspace. Yeah, it's not required everywhere, and uh, and it's not required, uh, you know, like uh, airplanes that don't have uh, electrical systems and and, and so forth. <clears throat> and some guy, you know, some farmer or whoever flying out in uh, uh, eastern Colorado, western Kansas, he's just putting around out there. He's in. Uh, what maybe what class D airspace or something? It's not required. But now, if he wants to come to uh, Denver, well, then that's a different story. So that's why the slide said most aircraft. And Jerry, when the nine eleven attacks occurred, were the transponders disabled, and uh, were there changes uh, made after after nine eleven that you can? I don't recall? know. I, you know, I really don't know. Uh, of course, the whole. When 9/11 happened, the whole air system, the whole na uh, national airspace, everything was shut down. I mean, everything. If you were flying uh, air traffic control, 
give you uh, instructions to an airport, and that's where you went. And uh, they put everything on the ground. So uh, I would imagine the radar stuff kept running, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, maybe that's not a very good answer, but, uh, uh, you know, everything was shut down at 9-11 as far as air, air traffic. I was in, uh, I was in uh, Wichita, Kansas when that happened. And uh, it took me uh, about a week to get home. So uh, I did fly home, but uh, it was about a week later. We had people out on the road that uh, uh, they rented cars and drove back because uh, there was just, there was no, no flying period. Anything else I can attempt to answer? Hearing nothing. We still got 57 people. Well, any questions? Uh, Club-wise, uh, uh, anything like that? Yeah, there's some chats in the or comments in the chat. I don't know if you can look at that. Yeah, let's see here. Okay, I guess scroll down. Uh, drone said uh, ADSB feeding brought up. Goes. So, uh, I'm not sure what you mean there, drone. David Hill has a question about any info on pave pause based systems. Where's that one at, David Hill? Any information on paves, pause, basis? No, I don't have any. I no, I don't have anything on that. I, I actually barely heard about it. I, uh, I can say I don't deal with that. So, and then Bill, SRLAJ has a question about: Is there a method which yeah. keeps several aircraft from transmitting at the same time, one second time frame, and interfering with each other? Uh. I'm sure there is. I don't know what it is. Uh, these are very short bursts, and uh, you know, as I can tell you, it 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 works. I I don't know. <laughs> That's not, not a good answer. But you know, I'm I'm not that. I don't have that deep a knowledge uh, to know. Uh, I know things are controlled by sensitivity, and so you know, you you don't want. Uh, things transmitting further than they need to so uh, and with uh, uh, interrogation you know they request the information so but they just be broadcast that so I, I really don't know I'm sorry uh, that's something to, uh, good question uh, I'm sorry I don't uh, and then Troy Lerner asked do you anticipate a shift from radar to GPS tracking would well, GPS what, potentially allow for more planes in the air. Well, that's the whole idea of ADSB, and and um, uh, well, the, the majority of airplanes today, uh, especially air, airline aircraft, they're all ADSB. Uh, uh, they've all got ADSB. Uh, <clears throat> when I started working on air aircraft, uh, uh, which was uh, I worked on DC threes, Convair three forties, four forties, five eighties, DC nines. Uh, Boeing 737, 727s, and uh, uh, all the the systems were all not integrated. You know, you had you had two nav receivers, and sometimes a spare. You had two comms. You had uh, a DM, DME, one or more, which is distance measuring equipment. It, it's another way of uh, measuring your with radio from uh, uh, one point to where the aircraft is. Uh, your your uh, approach, uh, VORs and, and uh, uh, glide slope and all that, everything was uh, separate. Well, you know, today, uh, a lot of these systems are still used, but uh, they're all integrated into a flight management system. So, uh, and this, they're really smart. Uh, they'll check, uh, they'll check each other. And if uh, data doesn't, uh, uh, it, it doesn't look correct. It'll, it'll do away with it. It'll give a, a warning. Uh, so we've gone from just individual, uh, what they call steam dials, round dials, to uh, integrated systems with uh, the flight management system 
just a fantastic amount of data and, and uh, it'll, it'll run your autopilot. It'll, uh, you know, uh, you just kind of, if you set it up right, you kind of monitor it and uh, it'll take you from uh, A to B. Is there in our future some form of satellite, geosynchronous satellite, LIDAR systems or things that may eventually supplant radar and give us Z-axis information? There again, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there's uh, SATCOM today, but uh, I don't know if anything you know would go beyond the, the GPS, uh, if that's what you mean. Uh, well, what I'm thinking is, you know, radar is absolutely necessary from a security standpoint. You know, if someone has disabled or doesn't have, is not transmitting any location information, then radar gives us some some way of knowing that there's intruders or things in the airspace. But again, it doesn't give us any Z-axis. And well, I wonder if there's anything that will eventually be able to detect that. There again, I don't know. I don't know of it. Um, there's, uh, like I said, I understand that your the perimeter radar around the United States borders will probably continue to operate. And, uh, but even with, uh, even like a Denver, they basically, they use the secondary radar because there's just less clutter. So, uh, they're not really using the primary much at all. And like I say, it like up at Aspen and stuff, uh, you know, feasibly, I mean, you could sneak in there with the transponder off and I'm sure it's happened, but, uh, not a not a good idea, but uh, you know, I guess no system's one hundred percent perfect. Uh, Gary, yeah, yeah, Tony G zero N. Um, the nine seventy eight frequency is it? Or yeah, binary? yeah. Uh, is is that still staying amplitude modulation or any talk of going to FM or talk of going digital and? Is that 978 broken up into channels like? No, it's all one frequency. It's yeah. all transmit and receive one frequency, and it's digital data. There's no, uh, there's no voice talking on it. It's all uh, digital data now. For aircraft communications, uh, you know, we're still AM today, uh, ancient modulation. I know the, uh, uh, and there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, as you know or don't know, if you're FM, you know, you've got a, a better uh, sounding signal typically. But FM, you're, uh, you can capture an FM receiver where uh, AM, if you've got an interfering transmitter, typically you can talk over it. And so they've stuck with AM all these years. Now, there's a lot of research and... Uh, the next step for communications will be uh, uh, digital uh, between the aircraft and the ground and so forth. And they've already got stuff developed, but uh, it's only being tested. There's none of it. There's no, uh, you know, ground stations or anything like, you know, uh, FA doesn't have except at test sites and all. Uh, but it eventually will go to, uh, uh, it will go in phases, I think, to, uh, digital and the thing with digital is probably you know they can uh, interface it because everything can't just throw the switch and automatically you know go it has to be phased in so uh i think you could probably uh they, they know of a way to, to to phase it in and uh, uh and they'll you know we'll make the airlines do it first and then everybody else will will follow
but it didn't seem to like to operate well uh, without a battery. It give you messages, and so I uh, got another battery. Just got it today, and uh, so now ready to take that back over and uh, get that piece going again, and then uh, we'll get the three three voter going again now that we've got internet and uh, so we're getting really close to getting uh, the wires x back in service so the internet's been the problem all along that i've stated before so uh anyway if you're a uh, yesu guy and you're ready to use that we that ought to happen uh, i'm hoping within a week but i'm not promising nothing <laughs> these days i'll tell you that that's about all I got on that. I don't hear anything else. So last chance. Crickets, it looks like we bounced up close to 60 tonight for Good. attendees. Good. Yeah, I think we had 74 last time. And like I say, keep in mind, uh, our next, uh, our June, whatever day June is, third Wednesday will be... Uh, will be storm spotter so that'll be interesting i think we'll get a good turnout for that and I, i'm thinking we'll be able to cert, uh, certificate i know jeff told me you got a way of taking roll so we got to discuss that with the uh, the presenter who's the noah noah guy so uh, that'll be an interesting one so we'll just continue to do what we're doing uh until until we can you know go back to the taj mahal and uh, see everybody in person and whatever that might be so uh this is you know this works as well as it can work i guess so thank yeah, and what you I'll, for checking in what i'll do just so everybody knows for the uh, june meeting is i'll have a link to a, a google form and you can go in there and put in your information and that'll add you to a, a list for uh weather spotter certification if they're gonna be able to do that so mm -hmm. fyi watch for that link uh when the announcement goes out next month yeah watch your uh, junk mail and stuff so you don't uh, you don't uh, you don't go to trash or something so any final questions well thank you everybody for attending and stay safe and uh, look forward to seeing you in person asap good night Take it down.